slow down. <coughs> Great way to start. All right, any questions or comments from yesterday? Yes? It's been glitching on me lately. There we go. Is that it? That's the only question or comment we've got? All right. We're talking about what? Yes. With the, uh, the project sheet, yeah? you do project one, and then uh, are we able to go up to the stop on project two? That's the idea, right? Well, wait a minute. What are you asking? Like, essentially, we're supposed to be finishing this, and yeah. we need your instruction to continue. Oh, no. See, he's asking, can I complete all of one, not have you look at it, start the next project, and go and tell stop, right? Uh, no. I, so if we finish this first project and you get assigned, we can start on this, like, tonight, for example? Yes, if you okay. get assigned. Okay. Yeah. I saw it. Yes. The due dates on those things, on, the, on each project, is that daily? No. Okay, so if you look at your project sheet, which I didn't bring one in here, on the first page you have a sign-off. Yeah, so you have, now there's a suggested timeline on that. It says one lab, two labs, go to the sign-off page. Very first page. One lab, two, that's about how long it should take you to do that. So if you figure all that out, so if it's Friday and you're still on the second one, so, however, how many labs have I given you so far? None, so, didn't have a lab because we didn't have a lab yesterday. So I front load the programs can be a lot more lecture. And then as we get towards the end, there'll be a lot more lab. There'll be days where we don't even have lecture. It's just all lab. So it all kind of works out. So there's, there's no due date. Just everything has to be done by the last day. All of the projects. And if you don't finish all of the projects, then you need to try next year. That's the good news. Yes. So it's okay if we start on you can, yeah, because it's all paperwork, and so if you want to do that at home, that's completely fine. All right. Is that it? Yes. Um, you know, it's just some advice. It's really easy to get, the word is myopic, where you, you focus in on something and you really focus in on getting a piece of paper done. When, keep in mind, that would be busy work, and I'm not into that. It's about the project. It's about learning what's going on. And I'm not saying anybody did anything wrong yet. But, you know, uh, one of the classes we have where you uh, overhaul the engine, you have to measure everything and write down the measurements. And a lot of students just get so engrossed in filling out these measurement numbers that they completely miss what it is they're doing. You know, and I can ask about any one number. I'm sure there's a number there, but it's like, well, what does that number mean? I don't know. It's a number. It's done. I did it. Sign me off. I'm like, well, you, you did the piece of paper is what you did, but we don't, we're not paper fixers here. We don't fix paper. The paper just goes along with what we do. You always have to make sure that you're accomplishing the, the goal of the task, then the paperwork comes. So if that's helpful, I hope. All right, so we are talking about what now? The Dirty Dozen, and, and whose idea was Dirty Dozen? Transport Canada, and um, there are 12 items. What do these 12 items represent? If we get rid of them, there would be no more aviation in, in, a, in a nutshell, yes. The 12, 12 things likely to cause an accident. Some of them, to me, could have been, it could have been like the, the Dirty Eight, I think, because some of them look very similar to the next one. Like, well, what's the difference between the two? And even when you identify a problem, like, I don't know which one it is. If it's that one or that one or that one, because they're all the same to me. So, well, it's just the way it is. I don't worry about that. We just go through the dirty dozen and we learn them. Some, some we're learning a couple of times. So, all right, this one. Pressure. Creating a sense of urgency or haste. Sense of urgency or haste. Mm 
this one's going to hit you pretty hard. We have 12 days, 11 days left. It's day 10, and you still have two projects left. You are going to feel pressure. pressure. And I'm sorry, I just have to speak freely. You're okay with that? Sometimes I say things, I, and I'm like, oh, it's going to make me sound like a real ass, but I guess that's what it is, right? Um, it's just truth. So the, the truth is, the standard for me remains exactly the same. It just, it always does. This is the standard. But what students, not you guys, but the other class, um, what happens is as the pressure builds and the time starts shortening and uh, these projects are due, students, not you, the other ones, have a tendency to start turning in crap. Like, I, I just hope this works. And they hand it to me. And my standard stays the same. So I look at the paper, and what do I do? That's not good enough. Go do it again, and again, and again, and again. So the more pressure builds and the faster you work, the further behind you get. And it's easy to you know, say, okay, I get it. But what you have to do is you have to just kind of remove the pressure or deal with it and just go, the standard is the standard. Because that's how we deal with aircraft. The standard is the standard. You can't cut corners in airworthiness just because it has to go. It's going to go when it goes. You know the old saying, how come there's never enough time to do it right the first time, but there's always enough time to do it over again? I don't know if you ever heard that before. So anyway, with aircraft, you just you do it right, and you send it out the door when it's ready. And that's just the way it is, and there's not much you can do about it. Um, this is, oh, I, this is what I hear all the time. I just need to get this done. Kevin, I just need to get this done. Come on, you just got to sign it off. I'm in a hurry. Well, guess what? I'm not. Quality first. Here's a, a thing. I don't know. I guess it's something I say. I don't know who else says it. But when you're working on airplanes, uh, sometimes it takes, you know, one person twice as long as it takes another person. Well, that's because that person's been doing it longer. So what is that person supposed to do who's slow? Nothing. Both of them should be equally accurate. Speed comes with experience. That's just the way it is. They, and when the project's done, it should look the same no matter who did it. And then the speed which it takes, just when you have experience, the speed comes. Just that's, you know, that's all it is. And a good uh, shop foreman, a boss, they know that. They understand it. And they invest the time in you to get you up to that speed level. All right, safety net. Safety net, uh, make sure pressure is not self-induced. I'm not standing over you yelling you to get it done. That's you. Or sometimes in aviation, you know, it's like, man, I just got to get this project done. Why? Nobody's bugging you. Nobody's asking to get it done. You know, my shop, like, I wanted it right the first time. I, I never said a word about you doing it fast. Just get it done right. Um, use proper planning. In this program, that means that you show up ready to work. It... Uh, it's, it's very frustrating for both myself and Kelly when we have a student who is actually a very good student, who, and we like all, almost all of our students, and we're watching him. It's like, oh, you've got to get that done. You know, Kelly will be like, is he going to get it done? Um, and no, the student will come in, and, and Kelly goes around. She'll ask you, what is your plan for today? I think she touches base with everybody every other day. What is your plan? Where are you? You're falling behind. What are you going to do? All right, I, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this weekend. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get all planned up. And then they come in the next day, sit at the table, grab a textbook, start reading. And that is just something you could have done at home, right? So plan it out. Read ahead. Um, communicate concerns. Um, why does this need to be done now? Does this need to be done now? When I worked, we had hired 
I didn't hire him. Some manager who had no aviation experience whatsoever and just didn't get it. And he was, you know, looking for his bonus. So he would just, you know, run on the shop floor and start screaming and yelling, this airplane's got to go, it's got to go right now. And I was the chief inspector. And so I, I, don't know, I could kind of do what I wanted. But I'm like, why does it have to go right now? Because it is, I promised it out. And I would just walk in my office and pick up the phone and call the customer who I'd been talking to anyway. You know, and, and sometimes I would call him up and go, hey, it's Kevin, you know, we're at this place. And, and well, a repair and I would say uh, hey working on your airplane working hard trying to get it done today is that going to work in your schedule I mean you got something planned and you'd be surprised how many times I'd hear Are you, no I'm not using the airplane for another week or two I don't care what, or, you know <laughs> and one guy I still remember one guy I'm in Hawaii I'm going to be here for a month I don't care I'm never going to be done when it's done I'm just going to sit in the hangar got it walk back in and go yeah I don't think so um, it'll go when it goes so um, ask for help if it really has to go, express your concerns, go into the shop form and manager, say, hey, look, I, I know it's got to go today. I'm behind. Can I just get somebody to help me do this? That would really be a big, big deal. You'd be surprised how many times like, oh, yeah, sure. No, 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 no problem. Or this is hard to do. Just say no. It's your certificate. And you can, it's hard to say no sometimes, but there's, um, what's the word? I don't wanna say political ways, but a, a nice way of saying no sometimes. Um, hey, I understand what you're trying to do, but I'm not comfortable with that. Would you be comfortable? If you wanna sign it off, I always turn up and put on somebody else. If you wanna sign it off, and we could do it that way. You'd be surprised the eyes get big. Well, I don't wanna sign it off. Well, then we're, we're in agreement then, aren't we? Um, all right, so we got. Here we go. All right, pressure. What happened here with our pressure? The airline, this airline ground incident happened in Taiwan to US airline. An aircraft was pushed back before the number two cabin door was closed and before the air bridge was retracted. So how did this happen? Apparently at the last minute, there was a gate call to accept forward late show passengers. See, well, that's why you shouldn't be late. Cabin door had already been closed. The purser reopened the door without informing the captain. The captain then requested a tug to push back the aircraft because the captain's in a hurry. This very neatly removed the number two door. Let see right there. I don't, you just gotta put plastic or something over it for that flight. That's gonna suck, so. All right, lack of assertiveness. <clears throat> I think this goes well with what we were just talking about, about ask for help, say no. You have to be able to be assertive. There's a very fine line between being assertive and an asshole. <laughs> if you work for a shop that has a good culture, none of this stuff matters. They're on top of this. And that's why I say you watch for the shop that you're working for. When they have a good culture, they're bringing this down to you. It's not you going up. They're the one telling you about the dirty dozen. They're the one telling you we're not going to do it this way. They're the one making sure that you're not signing off something that's not right. And then everything falls into place. It's not really that common, I think, anymore, unless it's a, you know, like I said, a, a shop I wouldn't want to work at, where it's constantly going the other way. Now, I've, I've been in both um, shops that were, you know, it was before this kind of culture, so it was just a normal to do things this way. And then, you know, as we learn about the dirty dozen, then it becomes the shop culture and it becomes the mechanics culture and then everybody is on the same page and everything works very well. So I don't want to give you this impression that, you know, there's a couple of good and everybody's bad. It's so the other way anymore. It's like most everybody I run into, it's like, man, they're fantastic mechanics. They, they you know, they're conscientious, they care um, and, and would follow this. You just have to watch out for the few bad ones out there. And if you want to know the bad ones out there, just go on Facebook. You'll find them real quick. Oh, my God, I'm off this one group. It's just terrible. So, okay, lack of assertiveness. All right, that is a lack of positive communication. So, lack of positive communication. of one's ideas, wants, 
or needs. Assertive is found between passive and aggressive. And I fit that perfectly because my wife always says that I'm passive aggressive, which must be right in between the two. <laughs> that is a character flaw I'm working on. All right. So what is our safety net? Ah, maybe we could look at the story. This is a goofy story. All right, what is this guy saying? Listen, I own the aircraft, and I say it's not a bad leak. Yeah, I've been there before. Um, owners are, can be pretty cheap sometimes, and they don't want to spend the money. And that poor little fishy's not happy. But, yeah, and that's when you just have to, hopefully you work for somebody who has your back, or you're assertive enough. But anyway, right here. So look at the top picture. We got an ambulance smashed into a golf cart, smashed into a golf cart. And the whole point is what's with that, but I just put the other picture on here. So you can see that the engine very neatly pushed the ambulance into the golf cart, into the golf cart. So here's the mishap that might not find its way to the headlines. An ambulance pushes two golf carts together, causing minor damage to the golf carts and the ambulance. You need to ask yourself the question, what caused the ambulance to squeeze the two golf carts? Look at the engine's uh, nacelle. That's this right here, the nacelle. Uh, see how it has pushed the ambulance forward. Why did this happen? Notice the red line painted on the ramp right there. There's the red line. Uh, let's see. Notice the red line painted on the ramp just behind the policeman. It defines the safety area where vehicles are not to park. So what do we do as ramp or maintenance people who witness an ambulance park in our safety area? Obviously, there's a medical emergency in the terminal. Do we say, hey, you can't park there? Or do we say, is there anything I can do to help? The assertive thing would be to tell the ambulance crew it is very dangerous to park there. Well, you get the idea. But um, one of the places I worked at, a great group of people and a wonderful boss. And when we hired new people, I would always take them aside and say, look, you know, you're probably not going to work for a, a better guy. He really looks out for us, you know, and he cares. Um, but his background's not aviation. I mean, he was a pilot, and, you know, always been a pilot and stuff, but not a mechanic. I said, so you have to speak to him differently. So every now and then he may come out of the shop and say, this is what I want to happen. Your first word should always be yes. Just tell him, yes, I will do, I'm on it. I said, but if it's, if it's a really bad idea, just say, yes, boss, I'll make that happen. I said, but then say, but, I do have a concern about that idea. And he will always listen and explain the concern and what your idea is. And I guarantee you 100% of the time I say, okay, do it your way. I, it happened all the time. So, you know, that's, it's being aggressive, um, stating your ideas, but it's not being aggressive, aggressive. So first thing you're doing, of course, is you're acknowledging that, okay, you're the boss and you write my paycheck. And if that's what you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Rather than just going, you know, well, what are you, an idiot? You know, and starting a fight right there. So there's a way to do it. You just got to figure out personalities and, and explain. And then once you figure out those personalities, it's, it's not that big a deal. It's all right, safety nets. Safety net, communicate your concerns. It's like I said, I'll do it, boss, but here's my concern. Communicate your concerns. And then refuse to compromise your standards. And that's where it goes back to setting your standards before you're in the situation. You can't decide when you get there what you're going to do. You know, if my standard is, if I have a known measurement, I will never ever let something be released for flight if it is beyond manufacturer's specifications, no matter how small, no matter what the circumstances. Set that standard, and then when I get there, I'm like, well, that's my standard. Yeah, can't, can't change it. Decided a long time ago. That's who I am. 
and then you're all set. Nine, ten, stress. Now we can probably skip that one. You guys don't have stress in your life, do you? Were you, what, um, name, what's your name? Serena. Serena, were you worried about getting in the class? Yeah, a little bit. So, see, <laughs> one of two, either you worried for nothing or that worrying really paid off. <laughs> Which is it? <laughs> Maybe, maybe not. All right, so stress, <laughs> mental, emotional, or physical tension. That strain, S T R A I N, pain, uh, or distress. All right, we all know what stress is. There's not a story with this per se, so we just go to safety nets. So how do we deal with stress? One, be prepared. Be prepared for the job. My wife was not always very happy with me when I knew what I was going to do the next day in the shop and if it was something I'd never done before, I would bring home all of the manuals and sit there on the couch at night while I wasn't getting paid and read them and get an idea in my head what it was I was going to do. But, you know, for me that was fun because I love being a mechanic and so that was not really work. It's not, you know, the old saying, it's not work if you love what you're doing. So I'd, I'd be prepared. Um, being prepared might be get a good night's rest. Don't be hung over. Be ready to go. View the problem rationally. View the problem rationally. Easier said than done, but sometimes we make a big deal out of something that's just not a big deal. And there's people around who would help if you would just say something. A lot of times people really care about you and they don't want to see you stress. And, and if you're stressed, they're more than willing to jump in and remove that stress from you. Go, oh, look, hey, I'll take care of that. Don't worry about it. Uh, take a break. Uh, throwing tools across the shop is never a good idea. I had one mechanic threw something. He got fired right after that. So That was not a good day for him. Boss just walked in. Next thing you knew, that person was loading a toolbox. I'm like, yeah, I decided I will not put up with throwing of things in the shop. That's just not okay. Uh, exercise. And then talk with someone. All right, stress is not always a bad thing. Stress, what does it say? Uh, we lost our best aircraft. How are they going to pay my wage? What if I'm sued? Oh, well, that is something to worry about. All right, stress is not a bad thing. Um, on either end of the stress spectrum, if we have too much stress, well, then we have what they say, fixation and confusion. I just say it's uh, high blood pressure and a lot of stress and things don't go well. If we don't have enough stress, we get very bored and start becoming complacent and not even paying attention anymore. So we need to have a proper amount of stress to be engaged and moving. So how do you find that proper amount? I don't know. I have a stress thing on my watch. I'm moderately stressed right now, which is good because if I wasn't have any stress at all, I would probably be exceptionally boring. Monotone, talking about stress. It's not a bad thing. There you go. So keeps you going. All right. 11. Guess how many we have? Lack of awareness. Failure to be alert or vigilant in observing. I have a story for this one. Lack of, I'm not aware of one. Uh, failure to be alert. 
not enough stress, you're not alert, or vigilant, in observing. You know, we just looked at a picture where the aircraft engine smashed into the ambulance and moved it. You could say, well, maybe the pilot wasn't being observant or well, you can't see the engine out there. So you can't blame them on that. It was somebody else. It's following the line, pulling it in, person's walking them in, and boom, that person who's supposed to be watching. Uh, you see that a lot. People just not paying attention to what they're doing. Um, maybe you're not being aware of what your torque wrench is set for and you over torque and stress out a bolt and break it off or don't torque enough. Um, just not paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, what is my safety net? Safety net, consider the consequences of your actions. That's kind of a big thing. I don't think people do that a lot. You really stop and think about, what if I screw up this thing that I'm doing? What, what does happen? I do. Maybe that's why I you know, have high blood pressure. Um, ask others to look over your work. Stress. Lack of awareness. Let's see. All the regulation said was install where it's easily accessible. All right. See, so they, they installed something on the wall, and this guy hit his head. So, let me see. Oh, yes. This is actually not funny. Yeah, kind of funny. Nobody got hurt, so it makes it funny. Uh, a maintenance crew was performing maintenance on landing gear and inadvertently retracted the gear. So this is obviously a, a 747, a very large aircraft. And they were working up there, and they hit the thing, and their gear retracted. So when the gear retracts, the whole airplane lands on the ground. Now you can't just extend the gear and it raises the airplane back up. You got to raise the aircraft back up and then extend the gear out. So you can see these giant jacks that they've brought in right there to lift up the aircraft. So uh, inadvertently, they used airbags. You can see the airbags right there uh, to raise the aircraft. But this is the lack of awareness part in hindsight. We can say perhaps someone should have walked around the aircraft before applying the air. So I'm guessing that the main landing gear didn't retract, but the nose did. So the nose fell down. So they're going to raise up the nose, which makes the tail go down because it's a teeter totter. And oh, there's the airbags. And so there, there it goes. Got it up off the ground and the gear came out, except if they would have walked around, they would realize they left a jack in the back of the aircraft, which very neatly went through the horizontal stabilizer. You know how much tape that's going to take to fix up? All right. And that brings us to number 12. Honestly, I could have done without all of these and went right for number 12. Number 12 is the one that gets me every time. This one is, this one is, I don't say the best or the worst. I don't know how you want to look at it, but it's called the norms. Norms. Let me see. Uh, never mind the maintenance manual. It's quicker the way we do it here. And you can see this guy is all happy and he's on a little fork truck and this guy's scratching his head and they're doing something with an engine here. And it's like, okay, cute little story. Um, norms in the context of dirty dozen means our group has a better way to do this job than the published procedure. Travel memory, peer pressure, or habit are other terms used to describe norms. In the following case, someone discovered a very creative way to accomplish a task and save 12 hours of labor. All right, so norms. Norms is the way everybody's done it. You hear it, right? You guys have heard this when you're working for it? What's the way we always do it here? That's the way we do it here. Can you relate to this in the story? Okay, so informal work practice. practices or unwritten rules that are accepted by the group. And it's just one of those things, whenever you work, it doesn't matter what the industry is, it's just, well, that's the way we do it here. Now, that could be a good thing if the rule 
you exceed the rule. You do more than the rule. All right? So we do the rule and a little extra. Okay, I can accept that. But then there's the, hey, this is the rule. Yeah, but we don't do it that way. We've always done it this way. Um, I always know I'm in trouble when I'm talking to somebody and they give me their resume. As soon as I start hearing a resume, I know this is not going to go well. And you know what I'm talking about? Where it's that, um, listen, I've been in the industry for 15 years and I'm like, oh God, I got the resume. And what they're about to do is tell me how I'm doing it wrong because they've been in the industry this. Now, if you have to use a resume to explain why, then you already have a problem. Because if I were going to argue the point, I would say not how long I've been in the industry because it doesn't matter. I would say, um, yeah, according to FAR 43 dot, you know, whatever. And so now it doesn't matter how long I've been in the industry, does it? Which is why I want you to realize that you're going to have a lot of knowledge and to never discount your knowledge because you haven't been doing this a long time. And when I got out in the field, there was stuff I knew where I worked on people they didn't know just because the culture was weird. And I'm like, well, that, you can't do that. I have so many you can't do that stories from the first place I worked. It's hilarious. Um, and I worked with one guy who's a really cool guy, but he never went to A&P school. He just learned on the job and we worked together. I'm like, well, you can't do it that way because it says, you know, in the manual, this and that. And he's like, he finally got mad. He's like, man, how come they always told me the wrong things? <laughs> but, you know, don't base it on how long you've been doing it. Base it on the facts. So, all right. On to our story here. This one makes me sad. Um, <coughs> story, story, story. All right. I remember this one when it happened. So, on May 25th, 1979, I was alive then. American Airlines Flight 191, a DC-10, crashed at Chicago Airport after losing an engine during takeoff. Now, when I say lost an engine during takeoff, I don't mean it quit. They literally lost the engine. It fell off. Uh, improper procedures were to blame. The failure was a cracked flange in the engine pylon. That's what holds the engine on, caused by maintenance procedure. So here, during the procedure, um, back up a little bit. So apparently the manual, and I don't remember exactly at any one point, the manual called for this procedure whereby the engine had to be taken off. I think you had to take off the whole pylon that attached to the wing. And then you took the whole assembly off. And I think you had to take the pylon then off of that engine and swap it to the new engine and bolt the whole thing back up. And you needed this special fixture to do it, which was readily available. So these group of mechanics over years had developed this procedure, I think years, it was just, it's the way they did things at this maintenance facility. They used a fork truck and they would go in and they would grab the engine and they would change it out and they didn't have to change out the pylon and it saved them um, something like, what I say, eight hours of maintenance time. And so I want you to think about the fact that, um, 12 hours, say 12 hours. Were these bad people doing a bad thing? They were not. They were good mechanics who used their head, or so they thought they did, to come up with a procedure to save the company money and time and money, right? So they're thinking they're doing the right thing. This was not malicious. They weren't lazy, right? I can't think of any bad things. It's just I could see how easily you get into that. You get hired by this company. You show up. This is it. We have to change an engine. Uh, well, the manual says to do this. Yeah, but this is the way we've always done it here. It's fine. Okay, it's the way we've always done it here. And so they did that. So they're using this fork truck, like the little picture shows right here. Uh, let me see. Cracked flange of the engine pylon caused a maintenance procedure. During the procedure, the engine and pylon were supported by a forklift, while some of the pylon's attachment connections to the wing were removed and others were left in place. During this procedure, the forklift's hydraulics leaked. So it had to be adjusted from time to time, right? The, the forks start coming down. So somebody's got in the fork truck and raise it back up a little bit, raise it back up a little bit. Um, at some point it ran out of fuel. So now it's out of fuel. So it's leaking down, leaking down. They gotta get fuel, they gotta find this. Later tests showed that under these conditions, leakage would allow a drift of one inch in 30 minutes. During the investigations determined a movement of one half of an inch. So they would lose one inch every 30 minutes. So the fork truck shut off. They had to go find gas. How long do you think that took? Maybe it was natural gas. They had to go, you know, change out a tank. Who knows? But even a half of an inch of drift, that would be 15 minutes, would produce a seven inch fracture of this flange. Seven inch. That's a crack that long. The resulting crash killed the 271 people on board the aircraft as well as two on the ground. 
death toll of how much? 271. 273 so far. Here's a picture of that. Somebody happened to capture it. There's the ensuing fireball. There's the picture right there. I zoomed in right there. You can see that it's completely missing the engine. And the thing about aircraft is weight and balance is critical on aircraft. You know, before I, I, I'm aware of my aircraft, but you know, if I were going to fly with four of you, I would actually, it's in a little program, I would play, I'd ask you, how much do you weigh, how much do you weigh? So if you don't want me to know that, don't fly with me. Now I'll plug it in, make sure that we're within the weight envelope, that it's balanced properly, because aircraft are actually balanced. There's an imaginary point of which all the lift happens on the wings, a center of pressure, and then there's a center of gravity. So if you hung the airplane by a certain point, it's that point is the center of gravity where it is perfectly balanced. And the center of gravity um, happens to be behind the center of lift. So swap that the other way. So the center of gravity is such that if the wings stop moving, if we lose lift on the wings, the aircraft will, yeah, behind. So the center of gravity is behind the center of pressure. If we lose lift, the aircraft noses down so that it picks up speed and starts flying again. So if you had the center of gravity too far this way and it did that, it would never fly, just back up to the earth. So the actual point of your center of gravity is very critical. So you have to load an aircraft in just such a way that it's fine. And uh, aircraft, these large aircraft actually have load cells on them and they figure out the center of gravity before they ever take off. So if you lose a large object like the engine, you're gonna lose a lot of center of gravity, plus you're gonna have asymmetrical th thrust all of a sudden and that's gonna cause a problem where it is unrecoverable. So. Not to mention on takeoff, and so much is happening, it's just unrecoverable. So anyway, that's what happened. And now, to make, what was my death count? 273, let's add some. Unfortunate fact is there was at least one additional fatality not on the official list for American Airlines Flight 191. One of the maintainers committed suicide after the accident. Why did he commit suicide? Because he had just killed 173 people. Yeah. That is not something I want to live with. So I would choose to just not have that happen. But you know, when it happens, it happens. It's it's it would not. I don't want to even know what it would be like to have to live with that that guilt. And so that's one of the reasons why I take this very very serious for you because I don't want you in that position. So that's why this all matters so much. All right, the norms. What is my safety net? Always use the written instructions. It's the person that thinks they know better is the person that scares the hell out of me. So we use written instructions. What if we don't have written instructions on how to do the procedure? I mean, they're just not there. What's that? Talk to an engineer. Well, I'm saying that there, there are things out there in life. Uh, you want to do something to an airplane. It's like, well, it's not in the manual. So if it's not in the manual, you can go to 4313, acceptable methods and practices techniques. Nope, not in there. Now what do you do? Call what? Call support. Who's support? Um, the of Call the manufacturer. Ask them. That's almost the tree right there. And, and then they may say something to the effect of, yeah, we don't have a procedure for that. You can go to a designated <coughs> engineer and pay some money and potentially get that taken care of that way. But yeah, that's, that's the exact chain. So, and money-wise too, it's the cheapest. Manual, manual doesn't say it. In modern aircraft, if manual doesn't say it, this ain't going to say it. Um, this is more for antiques anymore. So, manual, manufacturer, engineer. And if you can't get it in writing, in writing from one of those with a written procedure, you're done. Absolutely done. Um, you had to do something to uh, an airplane not that long ago where the nose 
nose gear was just, you just when it was up in the air on the jacks, you grabbed the nose gear. Clunk, 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 clunk. It was really bad, wore out in this one spot. And so we looked at the manual, and there, there was no procedure. It just needed a bushing. We just had to ream it out and put in a bushing. That's just a standard thing you would do in automotives, like ream it and put a bushing. But we could not find that in the manual, so we called uh, Piper. Piper's like, yeah, we don't have a procedure for that. So we called an engineer, and they tried, we paid them, I don't know, $1,000, and they wrote a procedure whereby I drill a hole, put in a bushing. You know, but I had to figure out how to make the damn thing straight. You know, I'm in there, the drill, oh, it was terrible. But we did it. All right, uh, let's see, where am I here? Uh, always uh, do not just ask someone. Do not just ask. There's so many reasons why why that just someone, a random person. I have story after story after story of bad things that happen when one mechanic is working on something, they get stuck because it's human nature. It's like, oh, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. This doesn't make sense. And it's like, hey, can, what would you do over here? And you're over there. You're doing your own thing and you're working like, yeah, I'd probably, I don't know, you shop air or something, blow it out. Yeah, good idea. You just, oh, shit, I just blew it up. And you're like, why'd you tell me to do that? I don't, because I'm, I'm over here working on my thing. I wasn't thinking really about what you're doing. So, yeah, every bad story I have seems to start with asking somebody else in the shop, what, you know, oh, what do you think about this when they're busy? Um, uh, do not assume that what someone else did Makes it correct. Someone else did makes it correct. Oh, and students do that all the time. They will bring me something like, Whoa. and and some you know I ask. I'm not asking me mean. Sometimes I don't you know I don't know everything. Maybe you found some bit of information I'm not aware of, and so I'm actually asking a nice way. Why did you do it like this? Oh, it's because I saw everybody else doing it. Now, now, did you? <laughs> well, you know, is that, that, that data just didn't work right there. Um, just because this is it is normal, just because it is normal does not make it correct. All right, that is the dirty dozen. But we have to have the positive attributes, right? That's the negative attributes. I kind of live on the negative attributes. They make more sense to me. Uh, but we have the positive side of things. And that is called the Magnificent Seven. And I am not going to go through all of them like we just did. Like I said, because I don't know, a dirty dozen means far more to me. But I will let you write these down. Safety is not a gain because the price of losing is too high. Our signature is our word and more precious than gold. When you return an aircraft to service, it's your signature. And it actually says that in the regulations, FAR 43. Signature constitutes approval for return to service. We all do our part to prevent Murphy from hitting the jackpot. Who's Murphy? Murphy's Law. Murphy was a real person. Anybody know what Murphy did for a living? I kid you not, he was an aircraft mechanic. If you find I'm wrong, let me know, because I read that somewhere. Uh, we always work with a safety net. We looked at all of our safety nets. We are all part of the team. You're working in one place where you, if you have the mentality of somebody else has to lose in order for you to win, you need to change your mentality. I know far too many people who live in that paradigm. There's enough for everybody to be successful. We work to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. And just for today, zero error. I mean, sometimes that one bugs me, but I kind of guess I kind of get it. Let's, another way, I, 
I, don't know, I live by the, there's a there's a proverb that is something of an um, if I get it right. Uh, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow for today has enough troubles of its own. So I just turn it into that one. We'll worry about tomorrow when when we get to tomorrow. Right now I got to worry about today and making sure I do the best I can for today. All right, I'm going to leave that up there in a second. And we'll go on a break.